All right, hey everybody. Um, going to do some video PowerPoint on Faulkner and modernism. Usually I do this in class, but I think it might be more efficient to just do it on film and you guys can watch it on your own time. Um, this is the man himself, Faulkner, William Faulkner. Um, really interesting guy, um, quite a personality, really known as uh, a storyteller and um, incredibly well read uh, and didn't have a lot of formal education. Uh, other biographical details, he, he drank a lot of whiskey, did a lot of his writing up in the attic. He was married, um, I don't think happily, um, and just a very reclusive guy, but also a big personality. Um, do some research on Faulkner and you can find out all about his quirks and there's a lot of anecdotes about him. Um, and I'm, and I'm not just a, I believe he's probably the greatest American author, him and Cormac McCarthy. Um, and, uh, I'm not alone in that opinion. Uh, so, um, if you are enjoying As I Lay Dying at all, um, check out his other stuff, or if you're going to be an English major and you're going to have a chance to read more of his stuff and appreciate what he's trying to do. Um, and so the point of this is to try to give you a sense of the style that he is writing in and where that's coming from. Why is he trying to be so confusing? Um, what is Impressionism? Um, what's going on during this time period that is inspiring him to shift around the conventions of what a novel is supposed to do. As I Lay Dying is, is one of the first novels that, that is truly modern. So what has brought in that, that modernism? Well, um, World War I was quite a terrible thing. If you watched Downton Abbey, um, if you listened to you know, if you had good American history class, you heard all about trench warfare, um, just brutal, terrible war. Um, first time, so many people with so much ammunition uh, just went about killing each other. Um, Philip Larkin wrote this verse here. Never such innocence, never before or since, has changed itself to past without a word. The men leaving the gardens tidy, the thousands of marriages lasting a little while longer, never such innocence again. Uh, so in a lot of ways, uh, the incredible harshness of World War I, um, it was a loss of innocence for humanity. Um, because it was just such a, a mass, wide-scale event, um, and so many people died in terrible ways. So, the age of anxiety. Um, what else brought, um, or, you know, kind of came along during this time and, and, and ushered in um, this age of anxiety? Um, We'll go back a little bit earlier. In the late 1800s, in the early 1900s, um, was the birth of psychology. And this guy here, Sigmund Freud, um, brilliant man, but also a little bit controversial, a little bit strange with his theories. But um, his, I guess, gift to Western civilization is the idea of the unconscious. Um, he called it the subconscious, and then it later became, yep, the unconscious. Um, kind of interchangeable. I usually refer to unconscious. What Freud said is that we are not necessarily motivated by our own choices, that we have a whole layer a being that exists beyond our conscious thought and that there are unconscious motivators that can impinge upon 
our lives and cause us to live out patterns and um, to get stuck in certain what he called neuroses um, or mental health issues such as depression or what they called back then um, hysteria or melancholia. Um, they were just trying to come up with all of the different diagnoses for mental health disorders back then and so they had a lot of weird names for things. But, but Freud said that the reason we get um, mentally unhealthy is because we are becoming victims of the urges of our unconscious or subconscious and that we need to understand what those urges are and bring them to light and that psychotherapy can actually do that. Um, an interesting quote from Sigmund Freud is that a civilization which leaves so large a number of its participants unsatisfied, unsatisfied and drives them into revolt neither has nor deserves the prospect of a lasting existence. Freud's making a claim here that as a civilization, you know, Western humankind does not know itself at all. Um, we are just now scratching the surface in discovering our true identity. Um, we've been battling over the ages of human history to try to meet our, our basic needs of shelter, uh, food, um, you know, and, and as civilization progressed, we were able to meet these needs, but we still have yet to know the big questions, okay? Uh, what is the reason for our existence? Um, what is it that leads people to have truly satisfied lives? Um, and he looked around and said there's not a lot of satisfaction at all. And uh, there's a lot of mental illness out there. And there still is. Um, so, again, just some of the idea that um, we do not necessarily have a full understanding of ourselves. Um, that reason is no longer enough to figure things out. Um, you know, the, prior to Freud, he, you know, the, the prevailing beliefs were that, you know, with, with, with discipline, with rationale, with logic, um, that you could pretty much figure things out um, and that eventually everybody would figure things out. That's the, the sort of promise of the Enlightenment and the Renaissance, that man is, is capable of all of these great things and with Newton's laws eventually we will be able to calculate all of the mysteries of um, physics and, you know, the whole nature of reality and maybe even God, you know, we will be able to figure all that stuff out through reason. Um, but wait a minute, Freud comes in with uh, this theory that there's a lot more to us than reason, that we actually live our lives under the influence of our unconscious. Now, how does he know what's his proof of the unconscious? Um, he, he would, that's a, that's a really good question. And the answer is, um, well, he looked a lot at dreams and the symbolism of dreams and discovered in that, um, that humans have a whole world going on, a whole separate reality that's unfolding in, in dream life. And, um, it's a new chapter of Freud that would take a while to get into. Um, but, you know, if you ever want to ask me more about Freud and the unconscious and, and his disciple Carl Jung, um, it's really uh, interesting to me and um, important to know about uh, when you're studying um, the influences in Western culture around the early 1900s and what we're calling the age of anxiety. Okay, another important historical figure is Albert Einstein, who, um, like I, I mentioned, Sir Isaac Newton back in the day said that, you know, you, with care, 
with with the um, Newtonian physics and reason, you know, human science is going to be able to figure everything out. That that there are mechanisms at work in the structure of reality. Um, it's like, like reality is mechanical. It's like a machine. It's just a matter of of deconstructing that and figuring out how all the parts work. Um, and within that construct, you had time and space. Now, that's Newtonian physics, but Einstein comes along and proves with his theory of relativity that time is not a fixed, um, what's the word, a fixed variable. Okay, time is not, um, it's, he says it's relative. Okay, um, as you approach the speed of light, time starts to dissolve, to slow down. And he had the numbers to prove that. Um, so the Newtonian physics, while it was useful to do certain calculations, it, it's going to fall short when it comes to explaining the nature of reality. Um, this is just a, a funny quote about uh, relativity that Einstein made. It's much more complicated than that, but I think we've all experienced um, time in different ways depending on the situation. Um, so that's a bit about Einstein um, and the modern quantum physics, if you want to look into it, um, deals a lot with um, this notion that um, when we try to study the building blocks of the universe, things like time and space, um, they are, are fluid, they're, they're changeable, there is a possibility of hundreds of um, parallel realities existing alongside of ours, string theory. The, the top level physicists of the world are, are, are really coming up with um, you know, pretty significant data suggesting that um, you know, the world we live in, the universe we live in, it is, is a little bit like a, a Star Trek episode. Um, and we'll, we'll see what happens um, in, in regards to that. But you don't hear people talking about that stuff on mainstream news. But go to any high-level physics class, um, quantum physics. Quantum physics has become um, the mathematics of consciousness very hard for me to articulate much more than that but follow up on that if you want to okay um for william faulkner how he's getting uh lost in all this we'll get back to him um who's next oh another important philosopher is this guy named frederick nietzsche i almost misspell his name every time i think i spelled it right here this is van gogh's portrait of nietzsche you notice I just think the, the the background, the landscape, sort of uh, really embodies. It's like his, his aura was one of fiery thinking, um, and I don't know what else to say. It's I think it's just a good portrait. Um, Nietzsche uh, is known for this idea of nihilism, and nihilism is this set of beliefs that really challenge, it's again along the, eye, the lines of what Einstein was saying, like that there's no absolute or fixed truths. Um, reality is constantly in flux. Um, and, and in order to describe reality, you can't use just words and language. All language is is just a rough metaphor to explain reality. Um, so religion, morality, it's all an illusion. Okay, we created this concept of God, and thus the famous quote from Nietzsche that God is dead. Um, and so if God is dead and morality is a human construct, then morality is relative to the individual. Um, so Nietzsche was advocating for a new morality, one that sort of defies the dualistic thinking of good and evil, right and wrong, good and bad. Um, but with this territory comes a lot of uncertainty, 
and um, and also the sort of harsh recognition.